Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Welcome, everybody. We've got another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. And today we've got a special guest. We've got Justin Moon, founder and owner at Car Arms. And I know you've got like an umbrella corporation, Justin, because you guys have bought up some other firearm manufacturers. So I know you'll, you'll tell us about that. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for having me on today. Yeah, for sure. Before we even begin, I thought I, I should show you. I've my, one of my first pocket pistols, a little CW Niner. So not just a not just a podcaster, but also a customer. Oh, thank God! I mean, I carry my P9 every day with me. Very cool. So for folks uh, listening, uh, the reason I was attracted to your guns, and we'll, I'm gonna start. I'll start talking about it a little bit, and then go back a bit. Uh, you were you were ahead of the curve in creating a small. A reliable, I know a full size pistol. I know you guys got 45, 380, 40 as well, but you were ahead of the curve. Everybody else was making big full size combat guns, and you in the 90s started making these small concealable pistols. Now it seems like the other companies have, have followed suit with, with, uh, with doing that. But uh, tell us a little bit about it. I was doing some research on you. You're 18 years old, your brother. Uh, introduced you to firearms and you developed a passion for it. So maybe just tell us a little bit about that part of your life. I mean, I started shooting more like 14 or 14 ish, or you know, 13. That, that, that time, you know, my brothers were going shooting. They used to take me. I went with them. I started shooting. And when I turned 18, that's when I got my carry permit. Okay. But the, in New and York, you could get was in carry New York, permit right? at 18, but you would have to co own your gun with a, an, another adult. So okay, so that that's was in I New think. York, correct? That was in New York, yeah. Okay. But uh, you know, when I got my carry permit in the late uh, late eighties, like it would be uh, 88, 89, Basically, at that time, you could, you know, I mean, you, you had nine millimeters and you had three eighties, and the nine millimeters were all full size pistols. They were big, mm-hmm. and. Uh, you know, if you wanted to have a concealed pistol, you would have to step down in power and go to a 3 like something like a Walker PPK. That's all that was out at that time. And I really wanted to have a full-powered gun, you know, 9 millimeter as in the size of a 3 but really there wasn't any gun company which made that at, at the time in which I produced the first car pistols. So, you know, I had, I've always had the desire since, since I got my uh, concealed carry permit to have a a small nine millimeter, a full powered nine millimeter size of 380. And then I went to college and, you know, I did a couple of years. I went two years at Vassar College and transferred then to Harvard, working on my economics degree and I was thinking about what I wanted to do after I graduate. You know, I'm an economics major, so, you know, you know, the thought was maybe I go into corporate America or do something like that, but. You know, when I thought about it, I really liked guns, and I wanted to, you know, I had an idea of a small gun, and I had, you know, I did some, started to do some sketching, sketching of my ideas probably towards the end of my junior year at, at Harvard. And, you know, I, I thought, you know, in that summer between the junior and senior year, I thought, hey, maybe I'll work on this idea, see if anything comes of it. So after the junior year finished, then I started to start, you know, I went up to, you know, my friend, my friend had a little shop at, in Berrytown, in, you know, in a little room in a barn. And so I went up there and, you know, hung out with him and started to uh, make some prototypes out, out of, you know, you know, first like wood, then plastic. And then I started making some stuff out of aluminum just to test the concepts to see if, if the, the ideas which I had that were viable and, you know, could work or would work. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, that gentleman still works with you to this day, right? Yeah, Doug, Doug Williams, he, uh, he was a good old friend of mine who I used to shoot with, and he also was, was my uh, firearms instructor. He, he, was, he worked in law enforcement for a long time. Uh, after I started the company, he, he, he was just helping me out for a few years, but then he, he went on to uh, do a diff, to diff, 
to do a different work okay. in security for a hospital. And then he came back uh, to work for me, you know, like, you know, maybe five to ten years ago. Okay. Very cool. Uh, now, so, now he's back with me. So you, you guys started doing this in a barn that this came yeah. out of some, some plastic and wood in a barn. How does a yeah, guy with an economics know. major engineer a pistol? Hey man, I just like drawing. You just get get on, get get you know, get some paper and start sketching, and then you know, you lay things out, see if they work. I mean, when I made my first sketches and came out with my first idea, you know, we had the rough concept made, and then started having some prototypes. I you know, got some engineering blueprints drawn up and worked with an engineer, but then he started to try to change my designs and recommended stuff. I tried his ideas and it didn't work. You know, he, he said I smart spring rates are all wrong and you know the starting design and the diameters were not right. I mean we tried we tried some of the suggestions and it it didn't work out so we just figured it out by trial by error and kept on trying different things until we got to a combination which which was working well. And then we shot the hell out of the prototype pistol, right? I probably first gun which I which I shot we, we probably shot like a hundred thousand rounds through. Well, that's a awesome. lot of and, and your original guns were all metal guns. They weren't the composite yeah, lowers. The first one for metal guns, yeah. Very cool. I uh, I remember seeing those on the uh, the streets and in certain IDPA matches and such. I actually have never yet got my hands on one to own one. I need to order one up at some point. But when did you well, decide to start? We probably get you one of the metal guns to check out. Sure. I mean, we have our new. Uh, 2000 and uh, what's that uh, 25th anniversary car pistol? I, I can have my marketing director send you out one to us. Oh, that'd be awesome. That would be awesome. Yeah. Once upon a time, a few years ago, you guys did a, a promotion. You were looking for video footage of people running your guns hard and fast. I don't know if you remember that. Yeah. And we I were mean, you your... can run the car pistols really fast. I mean, you, if you know how to, to operate the trigger, you, you operate the car pistols like you would a double action revolver. Sure. So actually, you're basically you're preloading the trigger on in, in the recoil cycle. So mm -hmm. when the gun fires and lets off and it recoils, you're actually preloading it. So by the time you get it back on target, you're you're completing the trigger stroke and firing again. So, I mean, shot to shot rates with the, even with the, with the car trigger, it's pretty, it's basically you know pretty identical to what you get with a very much shorter trigger like on the Glock. It yeah. really isn't. Different in speed, yeah. If you know how to operate the trigger properly, you you can shoot it just as fast as a as a shorter trigger on the the largest semi autos Because a lot of people think that the short trigger lets you shoot faster on a semi auto. That's just not true. What determines the rate of fire of a semi auto is the is the slide velocity, the cyclic mm -hmm. rate of the slide, and that's the that's the mechanical speed limit on a on a semi auto. So. If you if you know how to stage the triggers properly, you can pretty much shoot, you know, the car pistol with its double action only trigger as fast as you know, any other self defense semi auto out there. The so, uh, the, re the reason I brought that up is we were yeah. featured on your website for a while. I, I yeah. submitted a video for you guys because I carried this gun for a long time. So you put my video we've got a pretty substantial YouTube channel, so you guys yeah. You guys put the video up. Apparently, your marketing people liked it. But yeah, that was going to be my point. People sometimes poo-poo these triggers, but I grew up shooting double-action revolvers, so for me, it was just like yeah, it feels great. I dig it. Yeah, and the the good thing about the double-action you know trigger, especially for a self-defense gun, it's it's a, it's a lot safer. I mean, you know, when you're in a self-defense situation, I mean, you got your adrenaline pumping, you're all excited. You know, your perception is going to be, you know, a little bit, it's going to be colored by the situation, by the stress. Sure. And five motor action really goes out the door. So if you're going to, if you think you're going to be able to control like a single action trigger well, or he's souped up, you know, very tricked out, glock trigger made to, you know, be like a pound and a half, that's, yeah, it's kind of like. That's poor self-defense. That's kind of nuts. It's not sure, you want. sure. 
Yeah, I don't, I'm not. I'm not down with that. We don't. We don't uh, ad- advise such a thing. How long did it take from the time you guys started in that shop till you actually said, "Okay, I can, I can mass produce this and sell it." Well, you know, that that junior year was going to be between. I because I graduated uh, ninety two, so that junior year is going to be probably ninety one going into ninety two. So from there to the time in which I got, I had the gun working really well, which was probably 93. And then from the time in which I was able to got, you know, was able to take the functioning prototypes into production and shipping was probably out to 95. So you're talking, you know, good. Three, four years. Four to four years from the time where, you know, the prototypes and the concepts were roughed out to the time when we could, we could actually manufacture and ship the guns. So you're you're going to school, doing your studies, and at night and on weekends and in any free time you probably had, you're grinding it out. Yeah, basically, this yeah. Work. Did it you ever work. think this isn't going to work? It's too much energy? It's uh, Oh, I mean, up- there... <laughs> I mean, trying to get this little gun to function reliably, you know, it was was the hard part. You, you mean putting the initial prototypes together and shooting a shot at two? Yeah, that you could do that, but to make it cycle and to make it run and to be durable, that was that was really tough. And that's why we have, you know, we are. If you look at the extractor on the pistol, it's it's quite a bit different than than the extractors on on other guns. But we found that we needed that task. Kind of, configuration to really make the, the gun run reliably mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. uh we you know we we got a patent on on the on the way the extractors are designed so yeah it was a, it was a lot of work and a lot of innovation to get the pistol you know functioning well and running well and, and get it to manufacture that was a big challenge i know one but gun I, writer uh, back back in the day described it as uh he said a car pistol is designed like a Swiss watch. I forgot what writer said that, but I remember reading that. Yeah, it might be Mike Daddy, but uh, we've had a few fans along the way. Mike's you know, been really good to us. I mean, the, the pistol runs really well. I mean, even, you know, there's, there are the larger companies like Smith and the, you know, those other guys even say they've got their own small pistol now. And, you know, they're you know, very nice guns. But uh, when I look at them side by side and shoot them, I, I don't see them as being materially better or smaller than the car pistols which I currently offer. And the Smith and Wesson and you know and the shield configuration is, is still larger than my you know micro series, the P P M and the M K. You know, the it's pretty comparable to the to our mid size, our P and our K size series and but for the for the same size and their barrel lengths are shorter. You know, we've got the P series barrel length is about a half inch longer than than on the Smith and Wesson shield. Uh, so ballistically, our guns still perform better. You know, we've over the years since I, I started producing them to now, we've got hundreds of thousands of them them out in the field, and they just work. And, and Talk we, about ballistically uh, superior. Uh, what what factors are you? Describing in that. Well, when you have a large, a longer barrel length, I mean, Smith and Wesson is about 3.1 inches on the barrel length. The car, the mid-sized car pistols, the P and the K are going to be three and a half inches. So there's a half inch more barrel length. So the, for any any nine any nine any bullet, it's going to accelerate, have more time to accelerate, and so it's going to be leaving the barrel at a higher velocity. Gotcha. Uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, ballistically, the car pistols are still superior than the Smith and Wesson Shield. Or, I mean, the Glock is going to be bigger than our gun. Even mm-hmm. even the Glock and the, those other guns, uh, there there really isn't an advantage to the the new design of guns. They're pretty comparable now to our mid-size car pistols in size, but in terms of performance, uh, they're they're good. They they do the job, but I wouldn't say you know there's there's any material benefit over the car pistols which, from those pistols, whether it be a Glock, you know the Glock 42 or the Smith and Wesson Shield or even the Sig, you know 365. I've enjoyed and that now, little gun. 
Yeah, now we've got a, for, for our standard clock systems, we've got a, you know, plus three extended base, which we will shortly have out in the market. So you can put the base on, on the seven round, six round, and on the, on the yeah, uh, eight round. Yeah, that's a, that's a plus one. But uh, that's, we have a plus three base now, which will be available, which we'll be offering soon, yeah. You ever have any plans? Much. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit longer than than the magazine you got there, but uh, not not too much longer. <laughs> Actually, I got plans for. I got it here. Yeah. Oh, there you go. A, you got one right there. That's a ten round magazine for the PM nine. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Any plans ever to do a double uh, double stack? You know, we, we've looked at double stacks, and you know, we're certainly modeling stuff and constantly working on things, but. Uh, it was really designed to be a single action pistol because you know it was designed as, uh, for for concealed carry, and when you go with double stack, your magazines get fat, yeah. and the magazines not only get fatter, they get heavier, yeah. and so the concealability and carryability you know starts to starts to decrease, uh, and. You know, a lot of people who are the millennial generation are coming into the shooting, shooting, you know, sports. You know, they come out with the attitude that they need, you know, 15 rounds, 20 rounds in the gun and two magazines with 20, 20 rounds. They're carrying 60, 65 rounds. But uh, for if you if you look at the actual, you know, self-defense shootings and the stats involved with that, the average self-defense shooting is like five shots. Right. So really, if you have a you know a magazine in your in your gun with more than five shots plus maybe one spare, that's kind of all you're going to need as a civilian self defense person. Sure. I mean, you're you're not going offensively into you know hybrid situations as a a law enforcement officer would maybe doing like a, in a SWAT team action or stuff like that. So. I mean, I think in, as, as that millennial generation starts getting a little bit older and, you know, they've carried for a few years and, and you know, they, they start getting, you know, mature, maturing in their, in their carrying a firearm, they may decide that they don't want the extra weight and sure. go back I, to single. Um, I tell folks all the time, so I instruct across the country and I'll have guys show up to class and they're carrying what you're talking about and most of our courses are contextual in nature so people are cops that attend are carrying their duty gear yeah. or uh, armed citizens are carrying their concealed weapon occasionally we'll get some guy that shows up and he puts on a battle belt and he's just there to have fun but uh, for the most part you see these guys and they're got they've got a compensated glock with uh like you said, 21 round extended mag, and it's all up in a, a appendix holster, which is fine. But I think there's no way that this guy's walking around at the movie theater, going to the lunch diner with his wife with all this crap shoved in in his pants. But uh, I've got a friend, his name's Les Keys Martoni. He's a USPSA Grandmaster, uh, shoots a Beretta uh, a 92 series pistol, but his daily carry is the little 380 little micro yeah. 380 car and people laugh at him and they're like well you compete with that beautiful big beretta he lives in florida and he goes man i'm always in board shorts and stuff he's got a beautiful little pocket holster and it's like i could put that thing in my pocket and his shooting skills are better than 99.9 percent .9 yeah. of the yeah. humans so you know he can hit 25 meters, make a headshot with that little gun, and he I've watched him do it, and that's his that's his concealed carry piece. And he knows he actually takes that gun and practices draw strokes like you should coming out of right. the pocket, and he can get like one and a half second headshot hits at 10 yards coming out of the pocket with that little little. Yeah, I mean the, the the pocket 380s are extremely extremely accurate. I mean, you 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 mentioned appendix carry, and you know, I don't, that's the craze. That seems to be the craze these days. Yeah. But I don't know. That that's a good way to blow your nuts off, man. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a it's a there's a training issue that's there, and a. Uh, 
a mechanical issue. I, I mean, I, I would definitely not be carrying a 1911 cocked and locked over my junk. I mean, sure. there's, there's video out there with, you know, a, num a number of people. Well, there's a the guy who's appendix carrying and he sticks his gun in his pants and the shirt gets caught in the trigger. And then as he sticks it in the holster, boom, it goes off and blows up. He blows his nuts off. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there's definitely, it's That's not great. something that, it's not something that a person just getting into the shooting sports should do. Um, there's a lot of benefits to it, but I always enjoyed the hip position myself. But when uh, the clothing or uh, uh, area that I'm in doesn't allow for that, and I can't always walk around with a gun on my hip like you are in your office. you got to be able to conceal it. That's nothing new. Oh. Swashbuckling sailors used to carry it in their, in their waist or a cowboy. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but uh, it's not it's not really uh, a safe way because if you have an accidental discharge, it's not going to be good for you. Oh, I kind totally. of always like this behind the you know a little bit behind the three o'clock position, maybe three and a half, four o'clock sure. position. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that's a tomato tomato kind of a thing. And I think anybody yeah. that puts a gun on has to know uh, their limitations, their capabilities, their they're because uh, you can have a gun anywhere on you and if you're the kind of person that's going to accidentally to any of your guns let me ask you this yeah. to any of your guns if i load this right now will it ever go off without human intervention no no, no. it's extremely safe our, our guns are very drop resistant it's, that's my know, that's my point so somebody shooting their off what did they do so they had they had an improper process just like the quality right. control in your factory they had an improper well, that's, process. I mean, let's talk about gun drops. Uh, I mean, a lot of people don't realize that, uh, you know, if you, if you look at a system like the Glock or even the, the new Smith & Wesson, that the engagement surface between, you know, the striker, you know, the tab which sticks out from the striker and then the actual sear mechanism is, is extremely tiny, like 20 thousandths of an inch in those guns. And so, what really is the safety for, for a system like the Glock or even Smith & Wesson is going to be that internal passive safety, which they have ahead of it. And so that, that, you know, that's, how they, that's how they make their guns, quote, unquote, drop resistant. But if you look at the car pistol, actually, since we use a cock and cam system, the, the engagement surface is actually closer to like you know, 100 thousandths of an inch between the, the striker and the, and the cock and cam. And so, even if you didn't have the passive safety, which we do, we do have the passive safety in, in the car pistol. Uh, even without it, the gun, you, you drop it, it would be more drop resistant than, you know, than those other pistols. So there are a lot of benefits from the way the car pistol is, is designed. And it's designed to be a robust gun, which can be carried extremely safely. And I, I say, I, I would personally think that I personally think that compared to the other guns available on the market, whether it be the SID, the Glock, or even the Smith and Wesson, the cars with a with a double action trigger design and the cocking can mechanism is still more drop resistant than those guns. That's a huge factor, man. I don't. That, there are people that I've recommended your gun for years to folks for various reasons. I think having a firearm that is less likely to go off due to a mechanical malfunction or an inadvertent human error, it's never a bad thing. It's always a good yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Especially when, when you're pocket carrying or gals sure. use a, a, a loose, like a sticky holster and they've got it in their purse. Any time that, uh, that you can make the gun less prone to discharge the better without human intervention i mean we've looked at other designs i mean i've tried and experimented with shortening the trigger and doing all of that to make it shoot more like the glock and we've had prototypes like that but what happened is it turned it into a glock it wasn't a car anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you just made you just made a you just made a a yeah. a, 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 a glar a glar yeah like that yeah, so it it then it then you know that's not that that kind of would probably confuse the market with our product. So we we pretty much 
You know, I think right now that the configuration of the pistol is still very competitive in the marketplace. I think we need to do a better job in explaining, you know, how, why it is still relevant, and you know why wh why you would want to have a car and carry a car rather than carrying some of these new newer, you know, small, you know, similar size pistols, whether it be a Smith and Wesson Shield or Glock 42. Or, I think I'm going to do a video on that actually. Uh, I think yeah. I'm going to do a video on that now that we're talking about it. Uh, That'd be a good. That'd be a good topic. I think just the point that, that the thread that we're chatting on. When we're instructing, I always start class with "Why are you here? What's your purpose?" Right. Right. And I, I think that's the same thing. Why did you go buy this or the or the Smith or whatever you bought? Why'd you buy it? Because my dad told me to. Because it looked cool. Because that's what my cop buddy carries. If 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 you haven't asked yourself like some questions like can i conceal it with all my clothes uh can i shoot it is it reliable is it a safe mechanism is it accurate like people i think a lot of times just don't even think about that i had a friend show up to a class and he bought his wife a gun and i said why'd you get that it was a little it was a little micro i don't want to say what manufacturer but a a single action uh uh, all metal gun, nine millimeter, tiny little thing that she could barely hold on to. And why'd she get it? Because it was pretty. Well, that's the last reason you should get a tool that's meant for self-protection. I don't care if it looks like shit. I want to know that it's going to work and I can shoot it. I'm sure that right. uh, it seems like that's, that is a, a, common, a common misconception with people. They look at the... I've had people make fun of the hearing protection I choose because it's really big because I'm on the range and I go, who cares what it looks like? I'm protecting my ears. They're huge. They're huge ear pro. Hey, man, I'm almost 50 now, so I find that older I get, I really don't care about how I look or <laughs> what people right. think about it. Right, right. That's funny. So some of this stuff is uh, – is, kind of personal preference like you drive a ford i believe i drive a ford i mean i've got a ford i've got a ford raptor now and i also have a jeep you know wrangler so. okay i saw one of your pictures on instagram of your raptor you go camping so some people like ford like us that are intelligent and then some people like chevy you know le less intelligent that was a joke by the way that was a joke I mean, the, the Chevy, the, the Suburban, you know, the, uh, I got a, what is that, the Suburban, yeah, I got a Yukon. Okay. I was joking, by the way. But my point I is, it's just like, just, Chevy like, energy. <laughs> just like gun manufacturers, like you have different yeah. tools, different yeah. tools for, for different tasks. You, uh, you guys soaked up a couple other companies. You have Magnum Research now under your umbrella, yeah, we right? Do. We do. We've got Magnum Research, and uh, we also have Tommy Gun. I bought, I bought the Tommy Gun Auto Ordinance way back in 98. Okay. And uh, Magnum Research I picked up in 2010. So that was already, it was already that long ago. Wow. So yeah. you're making the uh, uh, Desert Eagle. The, the DFR, Magnum Light Rifle. You know, we do, of course, Tom, Tommy Gun, Thompson, Auto Ordnance. We do, you know, yeah, we we do we do quite a few different brands right now. So, is your is your Auto Ordnance brand? You guys also produce a uh, M1 carbine. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Okay, I have one of those. I thought that was your brand. Yeah, very cool. Is it? it is all of that under one roof now? The manufacturing or is? Uh, we're we're manufacturing out of uh, the odd ordinance product, mostly out of Massachusetts, and then okay. the mid all the Magnum product out of Minnesota, and okay. Georgia, Minnesota. And we're in transition of getting our Pennsylvania plant up and running, so we're doing customer service and repairs out of our Pennsylvania plant. You guys recently moved into Pennsylvania, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I like gonna, Pennsylvania. It's a very beautiful I, state. You left yeah, New York. Yeah, we were our headquarters offices were all out of there. We we moved out of New York, so we don't have anything in New York anymore. And probably we're going to be migrating more and more of our Massachusetts factory to Pennsylvania because that Massachusetts is uh, really an anti-gun state, and it's not getting any better. It's getting worse every year.
your your company's pretty active in Second Amendment protection and in the promotion of of uh, good legislation. How do you see this? I'm a Second Amendment lobbyist. That's kind of like how I dovetailed into this market space. You've been at this a long time. When you started I mean, in '93, that was just I'm, before I'm, the uh, the. I'm a hardcore band. Second Amendment supporter, man. I'm like. What what part of shall not be infringed do you not understand? <laughs> sure, sure. I mean, I think I think almost all of the well, ninety percent of the the gun control laws passed in the books should be thrown out as un unconstitutional. But you know that's not going to happen with with our current politicians. Sure. It seems like we're starting to see more of a division. Like you're out of yeah. Massachusetts, yeah. New York. Uh, Jersey, California, and even some Western states, Colorado, you know, enacting yeah. en enacting some some bans. I mean, the the Second Amendment issue really is a defining issue of our age because our country is splitting into two different countries. One wants to be socialist, communist; the other wants to be free. Uh, for me, I've, I've made my choice. I, I want to live in a free country. I don't want to live in a communist socialist country. I mean, my my dad was in a communist concentration camp for three years in North Korea, and he was freed by our U.S. forces pushing up north under General MacArthur. And, you know, Alexander Haig led, led the campaign to free the, the hung, city of Hungnam, where he was uh, in basically a concentration slave labor death camp. So no, I, I mean we, I know, we, pers from personal, you know, very personally, I know the evils of communism and socialism, and basically that that system is 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 horrid. It's like hell on earth. I mean, mm -hmm. you, know, you came here when you were about three years old, right, from Korea? Three years old, yeah. It's it's interesting how we have so much recent history that we can draw from like the story right. about your father and we just like eh, push that aside we don't we don't hold on to that well you know what it is right it's 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 the free stuff that the uh, people get you know they get addicted to the you know free stuff they get welfare from the government and they want more so they keep on voting for politicians who give them more free stuff and the problem is is that stuff ain't free it's right. basically it's basically taken from people who are working at at the at gunpoint. Yeah, you're right. And that's a hard thing for people to understand. Well, what do you mean gunpoint? Yeah, if you don't if you don't pay the yeah. pay the man. Yeah. Yeah, dump down with a SWAT team and SWAT team. You. Yeah, exactly. And that's that that like you said, it's a it is a defining. Uh, pivotal point in our time and I think uh, unlike no other time and it, it's not even about guns I think it's about the average American understanding what our founders intended what the Bill of Rights actually means that's the big problem people these days they really don't study history and they don't they don't they don't study history American history in the last 250 years and they don't they don't study ancient history like Roman or Greco-Roman history and so, so their, their, con their context in which they view the right to bear arms is, is, is in the skewed kind of neoliberal cultural context. Mm -hmm. I mean they don't understand that for, for thousands of years the, the, uh, the mark of a free man was, was the right to bear arms. I mean the reason why the Greeks had their democracy was because, you know, they had basically civilian militia armies and basically free men were required to have arms and to defend their property and their state. And you know, when invaders came by, they would get together and, and defend the nation as well as well as their own property and families. So, I mean, if you, if you, if you take away arms from from civilians, basically what you're saying is that you're no longer a free man. You're basically a ward of the state. You're a serf or you're a slave. And that's, that's what people don't seem to understand these days, that uh, having, having arms is, is a mark of a free man, a person who has some personal sovereignty. 
Well, it's like many of our founders said, we, we give up a little liberty for safety, that that context and that thought was, was threaded through so many writings. People, uh, rather than do hard work and take the risk of, of uh, having an armed society, many folks are now to the point where they just say, let's just get rid of all of it. Just but that's that's the that's the big misnomer. They think an armed society is 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 more dangerous than an unarmed society, and sure. that's simply not true. The crime rates in our society, especially when you look at violent crime, are much lower than Great Britain. And you know, if you look at even murder or homicide rates, you know, America's much safer than let's say when you look at Mexico. The homicide rates in Mexico are probably ten times higher than than here in the U in the U.S. And they've got draconianly strict gun laws where, mm -hmm. you know, where the citizens can't get a gun. Yeah. So the only people who get guns are the criminal government officials and the criminal mafias and cartels. So the people are just like sheep getting slaughtered by, you know, both the mafias and, and the criminal governments. Uh, that's what would we would what would happen to us here in America if we if we lose our gun rights. We would be ruled by uh, criminal cartels, whether they be, you know, having having the uh, the uh, title of being official government or you know just mafia. I mean, what? Yeah, that's, that? that 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 is the the crux of the matter. No matter how much good legislation you have, there are always men willing to impose their their will on others to get what they want, and it usually ends up as a criminal, criminal yeah. enterprise. I mean, I mean, we we can see it even in our society today. I mean, the lawmakers in general tend to exempt themselves from the laws they make. Yeah, and, and we know that the criminals don't follow the laws in, in the first place. So as, as a society, get, as government gets bigger, you know, gets more corrupt, you know. They pass more laws which, you know, burden the citizens while, you know, they exempt themselves from the laws they, they pass. So basically, as government grows, the people who work in government really become the established criminal class. And they have more in common with the criminal mafias than they do with the regular folks. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh. It's, very, it's very interesting how... I think we we humans uh, like to look for either really complex answers or too simple of answers, and it, it seems like far too many citizens. I was involved in in politics for a long time, helping run some campaigns. I was the vice. I don't chairman. know. My opinion is that the the common sense answers are always the right answers. Agree. Yeah. Agree. And that's what I was. That's what I was going to. It seems like too many people are looking for like these huge conspiracies. At the end of the day, it's. The average citizen needs to go out and uh, live like a good citizen, teach their kids to be good citizens, and not tolerate draconian BS laws. Like, we allow, every law we right. have, we allow it to be. Yeah, I mean, that's the question of conspiracies, too, I think. I mean, conspiracy is a part of our legal code. <laughs> Criminal conspiracies happen all the time. A mafia is a criminal conspiracy. Sure. Two guys talking about, you know, knocking off a bank is a conspiracy. Big international banks getting together to take over the finances of a country, that's a conspiracy. I mean, why is it odd to think that there are conspiracies happening everywhere? If you ever opened up a history book and read history, you see nothing but conspiracies. So you know, I guess what, 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 where I'm going with that is, is that most of the folks that I'm referring to look at it as if it's, as if it's too insurmountable. There's a room full of dark figures in Washington or in, in Zurich, and they're right. plotting and planning, and we have no control over it. That's well, that's true. There, there, is a, there are people in dark rooms plotting and planning to take away our Second Amendment rights. 100% agree with that. 100% yeah. agree with that. But it doesn't end there. Because... No. I can run a political campaign. I can put a congressman in office. I could get you a job as governor of Pennsylvania yeah. if we just right. sat down and we decided, hey, let's do this thing. And that's the problem, I believe. Not that I would do that, but 
your company, a couple 20 something year old kids sit down and say, hey, we're going to form a business that lasts for a quarter of a century selling pistols in a saturated uh, nation of guns where there's right. where there's entrenched businesses that will try to crush us with marketing. Yeah, screw that. That seems insurmountable. You didn't say that. You decided, well, you know, we'll move forward. I think too many people just automatically accept their their status, yeah. their fate. Well, that's that's what I mean. I I knew that there was a lot of competition there. That's why I kind of stayed in niches. So you know, my first pistol is a very unique pistol, and then I bought Tommy gun, and we got the trade dress on the Tommy gun. So I I own the design. Oh, cool. And so, the same thing with the Desert Eagle pistol. I own the trade dress on the Desert Eagle pistol. So I invested in in firearms in which I could control the the market and have a you know competitive advantage and and the differentiation from all the other gun makers. So that's how I've been in business for as long as I've been. And you know, now with our auto ordnance product line, we're also doing creative stuff like we've got a whole art gun line where we're doing commemorative guns and historical guns and so we try to we try to differentiate ourselves by doing things which are different from what the big companies are doing and yeah, the big companies, they have a, a lot of marketing muscle, and it's, it's not easy competing with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But you don't just say it's hard, I'm, so thus let's... No, we don't give up. We, we give up. We, we're able to carve out a business every year, and, and, you know, we've been pretty fortunate. We've made, a lot of, we've made a lot of profit over the years. I mean, when I got started, we had such a unique gun. I went to the show, Shot Show 94, and we see... Thousands of orders for for the pistol, and I was like, "Shit, man! That's, that's <laughs> I gotta go home and make these now. <laughs> I gotta make these." <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow. Well, I, every show I go to, NRA show or Shot Show, you guys have a huge presence there. You've got a, you're not sitting there in, in yeah. some back corner. You've got a huge, a huge uh, section of real estate on the show floors everywhere I've seen you. So yeah, I mean, we've been fortunate, you know. Thank God. So we we really are grateful to every all of our customers who brought our purchased our pistols. We've done we've tried to do the best that we can for our customers in terms of customer service. I think we've done a good job taking care of everybody over the years. I mean, we we you know people have a problem and they send us back their guns. We always repair it. Once at, once upon a time. Uh, a bulk of uh, NYPD coppers were carrying your guns off duty. Yeah. Is that still the, still the case? Well, they wanted they wanted us to put a 12 pound trigger on it, and, and we we looked at it and and we we played with it, but it really was the the the, the gun is so well balanced and tuned the way it is that when you tried to add that trigger, it really took away from what the gun was. So, what is the trigger point. weight on this gun? Eight. It th- it starts at about seven, and the more you shoot it, it actually goes to like a six, six, five and a half pounds. If you okay. shoot a thousand, two thousand, three thousand rounds, it actually gets smoother and smoother, and a bit lighter. So it's like okay. it really gets butter, you know, butter, you know, smooth as silk. It's really it becomes better and better the more you shoot it. I dig it. So you you guys move you guys moved into Pennsylvania? Did you move yeah. your family there? Do you guys live there now? No, I I live in Pennsylvania now. Yeah. Okay, we've got a lot of companies that uh, we do work with in Pennsylvania and in that that region. We teach classes in uh, Denver, Pennsylvania, which is in Lancaster County. We've got a, okay. a good, uh, our preferred steel target maker, who's right. soon to be probably one of the biggest steel target makers in the country. T A Targets, they're right there. I love that state. Yeah, it's a great state. I mean, it, it's it's a battleground state. I mean, we if we're going to keep America free, the Patriots have to win Pennsylvania. I mean, if we lose Pennsylvania, this whole country will either go into communism or go to civil war. Well, it's going to be two bad choices. That's a very scary, scary thought when you. But let me tell you, from personal, from seeing, from hearing from my father personally. Civil war is preferable to communism. Sure. Yeah. So if it comes to communism or civil war, I, I, I'm pretty confident most patriots will pick civil war. It, 
in this day and age, us just talking about that, someone could deem us an enemy of, of the people. Why would we be an enemy of the people? We I'm, just, the people. I, I'm not saying that we are. I'm saying people would say, you men are talking about civil war. Well, civil war, by the legal definition, it would be a lawful situation, right? I mean, sure. they're lawfully disagreeing, so you're going to duke it out. Nobody's exactly. advocating unlawful use of force. Sure, sure, sure. I agree with you. I, I wasn't saying, Justin, don't talk about that. I'm saying that that is a, I think on one end of the spectrum, there are people that rather than try to communicate like we are just talking and having a difference of opinion and, and hashing it out, there's a lot of folks that I believe it's injurious to this debate because right. they'd rather just say, F you, you liberal, blankety blank. Uh, but, you know, when, it, when the Civil War comes, I'm coming for you. You know, they'd rather just take it to that place. That may go to that point. It would either be we would have to figure some way to get divorced from them, maybe separate the country into California versus the rest of the free states. I don't know. But it's, 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 somehow we got to work something out. Cause. It's scary to think about. Well, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's wrong for, as you said a moment ago, we're free men. For other people to tell us we don't think you should be free men any longer, thus you'll live under our laws. Right. No. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. You have I any? Mean, uh, can, go ahead. Look at Venezuela. You can see what's going to happen if if we give up our freedom. It's, in ten years, Venezuela went from being the richest nation in South America now to being a communist socialist hellhole. Yeah. It's very scary so, down there. Yeah, it is. It's, it's terrifying. I mean, they did the same thing. They registered the guns, they confiscated the guns, and then they brought in communism. So, I mean, we, we, we know what the communist plan is, and they, they run on a program. They do the same things everywhere. The big difference when people compare us to other nations that have had uh, Nazi Germany, Australia, Venezuela, different places like that where where um, uh, new government came in, new ideologies came in, and then they licensed and, and eventually confiscated firearms or destroyed them and or destroyed them. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of folks, when having that discussion, forget we're not like any of those places. You know, like we, we're a nation born of liberty. Like it, right. Germany been been there for thousands of years. They came up on the... Uh, you know, out of the, the people from Europe, the Australians, a colony of America like us, but different. And it's, it's, uh, it's a different thing when, when it's been bred into all of us. Even you coming here at three years old, you had enough of that. You weren't born on this soil, but from three years old, that's pretty much the same thing. We look at liberty different than the rest of the world. Yeah, I mean, my father was, you know, for for a career in Korea, they have there's so much against gu guns, and they always have been because they've been ruled by kings and tyrants. But you know, after my father got out of the communist concentration camp, he of course started his church. But one of the first businesses he start started in Korea was actually a firearms company. He actually made the uh, he 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 actually made a, a air rifle which he designed himself. And he made the M1 carbine for the military there. He also developed the uh, uh, Vulcan cannon for the Korean military and 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. So he actually so has... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, he actually had an arms, arms manufacturing plant in Korea. So the Korean M1 carbine parts that I have probably were made by your father's company? Probably, yeah. That's cool. I did not know that. Very cool. Is that business still in existence? Uh, you know, he in in ninety eight there was a you know when when Korea went to through economic situations, you know, he lost that company. So that it's under new it still exists but under different ownership. I gotcha. Okay. Okay. I think that the point you're driving at though is based on his life experiences. He realized yeah. guns are a pretty important thing or weapons in general for the protection of, of liberty and freedom. 
Well, you know, he ran a worldwide anti-communist movement too. So he 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 knew he he had through life experience. You know, he knew what communists were about, and he you know he tried to warn everybody in the free world: you gotta fight these communists. You know, they're they're a cancer to the society. Why do people not listen? Do you think? Uh, I I think my father. You know. A, a lot of people did follow my father, and a lot of people did listen. I mean, he had the ear of Ronald Reagan, and a lot of the I, neo. I, I guess I mean, like in, 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 in general, like, wouldn't these stories just be so blatant that? Well, you know, my father don't... was a controversial figure, you know, because he was also a religious leader. Sure. So. There, there I I and, and don't misunderstand. I wasn't saying why didn't people listen to your father. I meant more in general. Why did people not hear? I had I had a family member that was taken as a POW in Korea, and wrote a book that's most horrific description of a couple years in uh, hell, and not because he was in North Korea, but because they treated him like a piece of garbage, and they were having to eat their dead comrades that was all that sure. they had to yeah. eat and he came home to a good life uh just died a few years ago but we yeah. hear these stories and then we still think like yeah it's okay let's kind of push our country towards this communist slash socialist yeah, it's, it's not it's not okay they kill millions of if, if we if we became communists they would probably kill 30 or 40 million people here in america it would be bad yeah they would definitely kill all the gun owners. All who the is, gun owners. Who is they the in your in your? Well, have you seen the Democratic Party debates lately? I I stopped watching the news about two years ago. I mean, Beto was out there saying he's going to come and confiscate our AR-15s and AK-47s, yeah. and and the the democratic party in their presidential debate are saying they want socialism in america that uh, everything belongs to big gov so i mean those are the kind of those are that's what you would call a communist <laughs> yeah it's 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 very uh it's scary but then you look back to to our founders and they talked about that these are the times that are are trying in separate a normal man from a man that's remembered for all of time in history. Right. And their right. times were no less trying than ours. I mean, the agree? founding founders were really brave men. They were, you know, I wish, well, I, I'm praying that we, we have those brave men still, and I, I believe that we do because America is still mm -hmm. a great country. I believe that we do as well. And that's the thing that I try to remind people of. As bad as it is, there are still plenty of individuals that uh, will stand in the breach and do the hard work. And that's the thing I think people have to look at themselves and say, okay, I'm angry, but what will I do? What can I do? And it might be giving some money to a gun rights organization. It might be yeah. uh, going and knocking on doors to help a, a, a politician get elected that will defend our rights or running yourself. Do you ever think about running for office? No, but we are putting together a freedom festival here with my brother, uh, my brother's church, uh, in October 12th through 13th. On what is it? What's a freedom Sunday. festival? What's that look like? It's, it's uh, honoring the Second Amendment. We're going to have a lot of Second Amendment speakers out here talking about what right to bear arms. Uh, it's going to be an open carry event. So it's going to be uh, pretty cool. This is advocated by, by uh, a church, huh? My father was a minister, so that's interesting. Yeah. I dig it. Hey, a lot of people don't know that Jesus was a was a assault weapons manufacturer. <laughs> they should, because it's in the Bible, man. <laughs> Let's hear this. Lay it on me, man. <laughs> Come on, man. You've you, you read the Bible. You know the story, uh, the parable, where, where Jesus whips the money changes in the temple, right? Yes. But when you read the, when you read that passage, like in John, it says that Jesus goes out into the wilderness and manufactures a scourge, which he then brings back to whip the money changers. If you know what a scourge is, it's a cat of nine tails. It's a whip designed, you know, with with claws in it 
yeah. to assault human beings. And it has no other purpose than to assault human beings. So Yeah, it's not meant to like prod your uh, cattle no. along. Or, no. Uh, so by definition, it is an assault weapon. So by definition, since Jesus went to the wilderness to make the, the scourge, he was an assault weapons manufacturer. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just laughing at at uh, your your use of modern verbiage mixed with that text. That's good stuff. Actually, I mean, it's, that, it's, it's that, fact. that could it's be true. the title of this podcast. According yeah. to Justin Moon, Jesus was the original assault weapons manufacturer. He was. He was. He was definitely pro Second Amendment. Well, that's. I don't disagree with that. I mean, we we every living creature has a has a right beyond any right given by man to defect defend and protect right. not just our life but the place that we live in and that's uh, i think that is a a fundamental flaw in our education system that we've lost ownership of this place like we've lost right. ownership of uh, people say to me like when you said they a moment ago well they keep doing this who is they they as people that you and I and my neighbor say, go do this, go elect mm -hmm. or go, go le legislate on our behalf. And we, we wash our hands of it and then we complain. It's, we don't take an active enough role in, in uh, government. Here in our area, we wiped a bunch of people out of uh, right. office and put new people in. But sadly, we put a new governor in. He couldn't do anything because there were just yeah. too many people in the uh, uh, state government that were against him. He did four years and uh, yeah. couldn't, couldn't really get a lot done. But that doesn't mean, just like your business, it, it didn't work. Try something else. Well, you know, the whole idea of, gov of electing government officials is you don't want them to do much. You actually want them to get rid of laws. <laughs> Right. The problem is if they're too active and they start making new laws and new regulations, it makes your life more miserable. It's funny you say that. We helped a guy get elected. Uh, my right hand man with Kerry Trainer was also a, a, a political uh, campaigner, went to school for uh, political science, and he ran a campaign for a local state representative. Good guy, Second Amendment advocate, uh, businessman. And he's now up for election for his district and his opponent a republican her her first hit piece to launch her campaign against uh against the guy she's running against she said in his four years in office or two years in office he's done nothing he's he's enacted no laws he's made no legislation and i remember reading it i was like yeah of course he hasn't it's not he doesn't have any laws he wants to make he's tried to repeal laws he's tried to he's tried to yeah. remove and, and spend his time blocking and trying to stop more more taxes more legislation more infringements on rights not like so in her mind her job is get elected go make laws and that's that's her thought process that, that's the problem i mean every law which is passed is an infringement on our liberty and people don't seem to understand that Every law, every regulation is an infringement. Yeah. Yeah, it's insane. It is. It's become, it's become freaking insane. I'll have people ask me, uh, I live in California. Is the gun I just saw, saw you shooting, is it on the roster? I'm like, what right. the hell's the roster? <laughs> you, have a, you have a roster, and then you, you look at this, and people that don't live in these areas or travel to them or buy you there in New Jersey. The, yeah. Possessing a, a hollow point is a crime. Yeah, they'll arrest what? you and charge yeah, you. Yeah, like it's Excuse it's just something that simple is absurd, but we ask for it. I dig it. Well, it may come down to that. We'll have to, you know, America may have to divorce itself from those states. You know, they'll have to make their own nation. I mean, they maybe you'll have New York and New Jersey and Connecticut be one country and California another one and. The other patriots who want to have a free country will have will will be able to live in freedom. It's a hard, it's be a hard the thing to think solution. about, but uh, I, I I'm tracking with where you're going on it. Yeah. Hey, I don't want to take up your whole day, but I would like to uh, I would like to ask you this. So I ask folks uh, before they go, if the people listening to Justin Moon never get to chat with you in person or if this is the only time they'll ever hear you talking 
directly, what would you say to them? What would the what would what would they remember you for, or what would you leave them with? Hey, man, I'm a gun maker, so I'm always trying to sell my guns. <laughs> you know, I've got a lot of guns, I got a lot of product lines. They're they're all good, but the first ones I made are the car pistols, and the car pistols I think are still relevant. So go out and buy a car pistol, man. They're great. They're better than anything else out there. <laughs> I like it. That was like a, you went right into infomercial mode. Right. I dig it. I dig it. Well, I appreciate, I know you guys are huge supporters of the second amendment. I, uh, I which in itself is a protection uh, or, or is the protection of our entire way of life. So as such, I also encourage any of you out there, if you're out shopping for another carry piece, look at, look at one of these car pistols. Um, I appreciate you taking the time. I know you're a busy guy running multiple businesses and in the middle of moves. So thank you for, uh, for jumping you. on yeah. here with us. Yeah. I appreciate you chatting and I appreciate you, uh, your, your dedication to quality and to Liberty. Yeah. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Same, to, same to you, sir. You folks uh, listening. If you enjoyed this discussion, share it with your friends and family on social media, like, and subscribe. If you're watching this on YouTube, and let us know who you'd like on next. Hey, if you guys own a car pistol, do me a favor. Post up a video of you shooting it and uh, tag Mr. Moon in it and car pistols. Be well. Thank you. Visit our website, carrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Carry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at carrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com.